All right, for more, let's speak now with James Ryan. He's Director of Research and Middle East Programs at the Foreign Policy Research Institute, and he's joining us this morning from New York. Uh, James, uh, first of all, I want to get your initial reaction to the outcome of the elections. Did it come as a surprise to you? And w what do you think were the, the key factors that helped Mr. Erdogan to win again? So the election results today were not much of a surprise after the first round of elections two weeks ago, where uh, Tayyip Erdogan reached 49 percent of the vote to uh, Kemal Kılıçdaroğlu's 45 percent of the vote. Uh, and we expected in uh, the course of the last two weeks for Erdogan to use that momentum from the first round to pass the 50 percent threshold and, and win this race. What aided Erdogan uh, were the things that have always aided Erdogan, which have been a strong control over the media environment in Turkey, you know, strong structural advantages within uh, the state. And uh, the opposition also pushed uh, pretty heavily on uh, nationalist issues, on refugee issues, which are also strong suits for Erdogan, and he was able to outgame them uh, in the last two weeks. Yeah, let's uh, expand on that, James. Uh, Mr. Erdogan on the cusp of another term in power, and he really has been able to survive crisis after crisis uh, from attempted coups to corruption allegations. So where does this resiliency come from? Uh, was this a fair election? Are they ever fair? Elections in Turkey are hard to ever describe as fair. Uh, they sometimes aren't even free. Certainly this one is hard to describe that way. Uh, Erdogan's resiliency comes from the system that he's built, which is a deeply entrenched patron-client system built around the construction sector of the economy, which allows him to uh, control levels of society all the way down to the bottom. And that, we thought, was uh, a system that might be on the verge of collapsing along with the you know, tens of thousands of buildings that collapsed in the earthquakes in February. But the opposition, which had a very difficult task ahead of it, ahead of them, bridging together a very diverse uh, ideological coalition uh, to take Erdogan on, didn't prove up to the task. And James, this was the first ever presidential runoff for Mr. Erdogan, and it wasn't a crushing defeat for those who want to change. So as Mr. Erdogan extends his rule for another five years, do you expect him to be more strong-handed or will he be more compromising? I think he's going to be more strong-handed. He hasn't shown many uh, signs in the past 20 years of being a compromising sort of person. What I think is going to happen is the opposition is going to have a long, dark night of the soul and figure out how they can reorganize themselves uh, and present a, a different kind of coalition uh, in a future election. There are local elections in a year. The opposition coalition does still hold mayoralities in Istanbul, Izmir, Ankara, Turkey's three largest cities. Uh, those cities also went to Mr. Kılıçdaroğlu over the weekend and, and as well as they had um, two weeks previously. I think uh, they're going to focus very hard on controlling uh, those territories, controlling those cities. Municipalities ha still have a lot of power in Turkey. But uh, Erdogan has everything to gain by putting, uh, pulling any trick out of the box that he can in terms of the state uh, in the run up to those elections a year from now. Mr. Kelic Tirola is a career politician. Do you think this is the last that we've seen of him or will he continue? I think the that we're not going to see uh, Mr. Kelic Tirola in the leadership position of the CHP for very long, the, the main opposition party. It's a very open question as to who might step into his shoes and what kind of party uh, they may seek to create. Uh, Mr. Kulich changed the party in some ways, opened up what had been a very staunchly Kemalist, uh, very clearly nationalist uh, party over the last 13 years or so that he has been in charge of that party. It hasn't gained them much in elections. Uh, we will see uh, if they learn any lessons, uh, and there are going to be party congresses in the coming months to determine that. I don't expect him to continue. He is 73 years old. Uh, but, you know, we don't know for sure who is going to take his seat.
Mm. And James, on the world stage, uh, Mr. Erdogan has a reputation of being transactional, um, while the opposition promised a more pro-Western, pro-NATO foreign policy. So what would five more years of Erdogan mean uh, for Turkey's relationship like, like the U.S. and NATO? Well, I think Turkish foreign policy is going to continue to take an independent course. It's also going to be very much driven by the economic situation uh, in Turkey. President Erdogan's first challenge in his new term is going to be dealing with uh, a foreign a debt reserve crisis that is mounting. Uh, we saw two days before the election start, their federal reserves or their, their foreign uh, cash reserves go to net zero. And that's only going to get worse with the amount of spending that he's been conducting in the course of the, the campaign and the run up here. Uh, they need foreign investment from wherever they can get it. And Turkish foreign policy uh, is very much going to be on the offer, uh, you know, whether it's going to be to, to regional uh, partners in the Gulf or to Russia or to partners in the West that are willing to work with Erdogan or that Erdogan's willing to work with. Um, so I think, like you said, uh, things are going to be very transactional in the short term. Uh, I think EU and Western partners like NATO can expect things to continue in an independent route. But the major driver of Turkish foreign policy in the next six to 12 months is going to be Erdogan's challenge uh, with the economy. OK, well, when it comes to partners, uh, Turkey has been getting closer to Russia with uh, Mr. Erdogan continuing his rule. James, what does the West need to do to prevent him from getting even cozier with Vladimir Putin? That's a hard task because, honestly, Turkey has always played a balancing act between Russia and the West. And this existed before Erdogan, before Putin. Um, but I think in the near term, you have to deal with the deals that you have in place. Uh, you have to set clear boundaries and you have to set clear goals for uh, Turkey to work with you. Uh, the most immediate of those issues for NATO is going to be Swedish acc accessions. Turkey already voted to allow Finland into NATO. They took that deal separately. Uh, and I think if it's made very, very clear that uh, the F-16 sale that's been slowly moving its way through Congress over the course of this campaign is the contingent factor for Swedish, ac Swedish accession to NATO and, and Turkey's approval of that, uh, we may get it. We may get something like that from Turkey. But again, it's going to proceed, like you said, on that transactional basis. All right, James, uh, I'm afraid we have to leave it there. But thank you so much for your expertise and your time this morning. James Ryan from the Foreign Policy Research Institute.